She's taking my time, convince me she's fine, but when she leaves me I'm not sure, it's always the same, she's playing her game. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Peter Andrew Mugaura. I work with the Brand Communication and Marketing Department of Prudential Uganda. And so on behalf of everyone at Prudential, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Prudential Knowledge Series. But just to get a few things out of the way, I'll request those of us seated at the back uh, to move to the front. Uh, let's fill up the, fr the front spaces. Uh, to save the very late comers from the walk of shame uh, when they have to come and fill up the ones at the front. So I request that we all move to the front. Those of us at the back, the table at the back, uh, please do move to the front. Let's fill up those spaces. Uh, but once again, in a, a very delightful way, I would like to welcome you to this uh, special edition of the Prudential Knowledge Series. Just as a quick background for especially those of us that may be joining us for the first time uh, for the uninitiated, if I may call them that. Uh, the Prudential Knowledge Series is a series of uh, thought leadership conversations that was started at the height of the very first lockdown. If you remember, at, uh, during the first lockdown, we were all in panic. Uh, we had stocked up so much food. We were measuring our posho to see if, it could fee, if, if a quarter kilo of posho could, 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 feed, could feed our families for a week. We had bought all the tissue paper from the, from the supermarkets, and we were scared for the future. But also, that particular uh, conversation, that particular period of time, caused conversations about what else can we do apart from our jobs, because some people were unfortunately laid off their work, uh, were stuck in our homes, working from home. And so people were looking for alternatives. And I recall that a lot of people then um, began to use YouTube a lot. People learned how to bake. I have a friend who began a baking business uh, thanks to, 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 to the lockdown, because his wife and himself 
uh, did a lot of those classes on YouTube and picked up a, a baking habit and now it's a business. And so we began a thought leadership series. And our very first thought leadership series, if I recall correctly, was to do with uh, investing and sustaining small businesses. Um, because the talk for everyone was, we need a side hustle. And as anyone knows, and I'm glad that my, the compliance person from Prudential is not here, all of us have side hustles, those of us that are employed. Um, at least for an average Ugandan. Uh, all of us have tried to, I have personally tried to dip my toes in a bit of business. Uh, I failed miserably. And then I realized, I realized the best thing, my only side hustle can be my cows. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I look after cows like I, when I'm out at Prudential. Uh, something I announce everywhere I go. Then the next conversation was understanding agribusiness. We hosted a, a, a webinar on that. It was well attended. I think we had, and this, this was strictly online. We had over 800 people join us for that conversation on understanding agribusiness. And we followed that up with education in the new normal because schools were closed. As you may know, Uganda had one of the toughest and longest lockdowns in the world and schools were closed for about two years. I know people who have been in P7 for two, for two years or P6 for two years. Uh, and so we had our professional age series about understanding um, education in the new normal. And we hosted uh, Manuela Mulondo, who has developed a curriculum for early childhood development, which has been co-opted by the government of Uganda. We hosted uh, the principal of Vienna College and they were very intense, interesting conversations. And then that led to our most recent uh, webinar, which was on how to save for short and long-term goals. Another well-attended uh, webinar. And now that things are slowly starting to turn back to the old, we've hosted our first ever Prudential Knowledge Series with an in-house audience and an audience that is joining us via YouTube. Um, and today we are discussing, we are discussing how, to, how SMEs can access uh, funding or investments for growth to unlock Uganda's potential. Because like I said, each and every one of us here that is employed probably has a side hustle. Those of us that are not, that are not employed have a dream, but we also know that your passion for your dream is not enough to spur the growth of your your business or your dream. And therefore, you need to look for ways, how can you then access investments? How can you, inve how can you access funding to, to help you grow your business? And we've assembled a very, very um, interesting, uh, very knowledgeable, very experienced panel of people that will speak to us. We will have a keynote address that will be delivered uh, by the Honorable Maria Chiwanuka, uh, she's an entrepreneur, she's an economist, but also she was formerly a minister of finance uh, in the government of Uganda for I think about five years, and she's currently uh, the senior presidential advisor on financial matters, dealing mostly with uh, matters to do with Brit Br Br Breton Woods institutions, that's the World Bank, the IM I IMF. And so once she's been ushered into this hall, uh, we will get this show on the road, but if I may also uh, just quickly uh, jump, uh, do a bit of introductions or point out to the people that are going to be speaking to us before they are officially welcomed by our moderator. Uh, we do have uh, Tony Otoa. Uh, Tony Otoa is the chief executive at the Stambic Business Incubator. Those of us that know Tony Otoa know that he can speak from now until the cows come home but we are glad we have a moderator to, to keep him on a leash. Uh, we have uh, Maxima Musimenta of Livara. Uh, Maxima is very passionate about uh, uh, organic cosmetics and hair products. I wonder, the one time she gave a talk at, uh, at my Rotary Club, I asked her if there's a solution for people like me who are losing their hair, uh, not by free will. And, uh, I don't know if you've come up with a solution for that, but I hope that uh, you'll be telling us that you've come up with a solution for that so I can be a very big client of yours. Maxima Musimenta will be sharing with us, sorry, Simenta, will be sharing with us 
um, the story of Livara. It's a story of passion, but if you've tried your hand at business, you know passion is not enough to grow it, to spite it, and so she will delve into all the matters to do with uh, how she harnessed investment and financing opportunities to grow Livara into uh, the business that it is today. Uh, the other person is Dr. Gudula Naiga Basaza, a Managing Director at Goody Incubation Center. Uh, she's also the chairperson for the Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Association Limited. Oh, you no longer? I thought it was limitless in terms of terms. <laughs> oh, her, 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 term, her term got done. You should have picked her, you should have borrowed a leaf from somewhere. Uh, but she'll be speaking to financing for women entrepreneurs and how to go about it. Uh, so I see a lot of people that kept time mostly were ladies, lady entrepreneurs. So I'm sure you came with a I'm sure you, I hope you came with a notebook and you're ready to take, in, to take all these notes and learn from uh, the wealth of knowledge that she has. Um, the moderator for this, for this uh, particular conversation will not be myself because if you're not talking about communications or cattle, I am out of my depth. And so we have a gentleman called Samuel Setumba. Uh, he's a business editor. I'm sure you've seen him a lot on your TV screens. Uh, Someone once remarked that he delivers business news like an economics class, uh, and he will ably lead the conversation uh, once we delve into it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, to, to point out too, we do have a couple of people that will be joining us. The National Social Security Fund will be joining us, their financial literacy program team. If they're not here, will be coming here, to, will be with us. Uh, we shall have Mr. John Walugembe from the Federation of SMEs. Uh, he will stand in most likely for the private sector foundation representative who could not make it at the very last minute. Um, and I think that's about it. I've, I, I hope I've set the picture for all of us. But once again, I'll request everyone at the back to please move to the front so that we allow our friends that uh, are keeping Ugandan time to not have the very long walk of shame to the front uh, in the middle of the conversation. I will then ask uh, our, our DJ to just play a, a short musical interlude, and then we'll, we will we'll dive right into it. So uh, our music person, if we just do a short musical interlude for about 30 seconds, and then we'll be back with, uh, with, uh, with, with today's uh, heart of the matter. The DJ has gone to his side hustle. My name is Edwin Seka, a farmer and a businessman. Jonathan was my young brother. We had visions, plans, and dreams, but unfortunately, Jonathan left me. Jonathan left behind a two-year-old uh, son. A few days after Jonathan's burial, I received a call from Prudential informing me that Jonathan had an education policy with them for his son Elvis, that Prudential would pay for Elvis's school fees up to university. That meant that Elvis would get the best education possible. With over 24 million satisfied customers worldwide and 170 years of existence, don't worry about your child's future education. Be happy with True EduSave and let's face life together. Tuli Nawi.
stare into the future, what comes to your mind? Will you be happy and relaxed? Or will you be working twice as hard even in your old years? The decisions you make today will shape your tomorrow. Time as we know is fast spent as the years go by. Will you still have the strength to work as hard as you do now? Will you still be able to afford a comfortable living? The list of what we need to take care of today is equally long and tedious. Medical bills, education, food, clothing, shelter, you name it. We are too busy taking care of today that we forget that our future needs to be catered to. Get yourself a Pru Investor Plus policy and enjoy peace tomorrow. Rest assured that should anything happen to you, your loved ones will be financially secure. With this plan, you can grow wealth for the people that depend on you with an option of getting some money every three years, should you need it. How it works. All you need to do is make regular contributions either monthly, quarterly, half yearly or yearly as you are able to. 20% of your premium goes towards your insurance benefits and 80% is allocated to your investment fund. Remember, your investment fund is accessible every three years. Just like that, little by little, you would have made enough to take care of yourself and your loved ones. It takes courage to make the decision to invest in your future. Make that decision today. Contact us today. Email customercare at prudential.ug or call plus 256 312 251 400 or WhatsApp 0707 444467. Let's face life together. Tulinawe. Prudential is regulated by the Insurance Regulatory Authority of Uganda. Um, so I'll, for the umpteenth time, I'll welcome you to this uh, special Prudential Energy Series. Uh, and today's conversation, we are looking at how SMEs and entrepreneurs can explore and understand new ways of financing with our core strategic priorities being around uh, building thought, thought leadership around this and uh, contributing to the growth of small businesses in Uganda. Uh, as you may already know, I think the bulk of economic activity in this country is carried on the very uh, lean backs or the lean back of uh, SMEs, small and medium, medium enterprises. And they form a huge chunk of the economy and they also form a huge chunk of where, a, a, a huge chunk of where the country draws some of its revenues. Um, and so to officially welcome us to this occasion is the newest Ugandan, <laughs> I may call him that, in the audience today. Uh, join me in welcoming the Chief Executive Officer of Prudential Uganda, Mr. Tete Aitevi. The, the newest Ugandan, indeed. Um, I'm proud to be, as to whether I can actually deliver on the language fully is another task altogether. Um, our honorable keynote speaker, Honorable Maria Chiwanuka, our panelists for today, Tony Otua, the Chief Executive Stambik Incubator, Steven Asimwe, the CEO for the Private Sector Foundation in Uganda, Maxima Musimenta, CEO Livera Cosmetics, Dr. Gudula Naiga Basaza, MD, Goody Incubation Center, all companies, businesses, and organizations present. Our partner media houses in attendance, invited guests, 
all guests who are joining us online, ladies and gentlemen. Mulimutia Banyabo ne Pasebo. So I have integrated properly, haven't I? Thank you very much. <laughs> I thank you all for honoring this invitation uh, to be part of this occasion where we experience ideas, tips, and inspirations that would share, uh, that would be shared with us all. And as you've all noticed, um, I'm the newest um, Ugandan in town, still trying to find my feet um, in, this, in this lovely um, country of yours. But before I ever set foot in the pride um, of Africa, the Pearl of Africa, I learned of its great potential for growth. And that not lo very long ago, Uganda ranked as one of the world's most entrepreneurial countries by the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which recorded the highest youth entrepreneurs with 55.6% of the youth population involved in new or established businesses. The World Bank tells us more of the opportunities that small and medium enterprises bring, and it also tells us that SMEs play a major role in developing countries, accounting for about 90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment worldwide. In the formal SME sector, they contribute about 40% of the national income in terms of GDP in emerging economies. Now, this potential for growth is why we at Prudential have a lot of faith in Uganda as a country and a continent at large. We see the youthful energy that abounds in Uganda, a young working population that is technologically savvy and has a thirst to find new knowledge that would enable them to be wealthier and also guarantees them a sound financial future. However, despite being ranked the world's most entrepreneurial country, few Ugandan businesses hit the big time. And in our conversation today, we aim to rethink how SMEs can leap from surviving to thriving in this economy through financing and investment. What we are doing here today is part of a carefully designed plan by Prudential to bring thought leaders together, to be an oasis of knowledge, sharing for people that are looking to continuously make their lives and businesses and well-being better. I'm excited to see that today's knowledge sharing edition, this idea which was brought to, to pass during the pandemic, it will be aimed at helping the public deal with the unprecedented changes which have been ushered by the pandemic. And hopefully today we are catering to a topic that is at the heart of many Ugandans. It is my sincere hope that all of us here today and those joining us online via YouTube would have a lot to learn from today's knowledge series. I therefore wish to take this opportunity to invite our keynote speaker, Honorable Madam Chiwanuka, to give her address on financing and investment opportunities to unlock Uganda's potential. I also wish to take this opportunity to congratulate her on her most recent appointment as the board chair of Airtel Mobile Commerce Uganda Limited one of Uganda's leading mobile financial services provider. Honorable Maria Chiwanuka, as you all must know, was Uganda's Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development between 2011 and 2015. She's an accomplished development and finance expert with over 15 years working experience at the World Bank as an economist and a financial analyst in different parts of the world. Thank you, Madam, for honoring our invitation and we look forward to learning a lot from you. You're welcome on stage. Thank you all for coming here today. Let us face life together, Tulinawe. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together as we welcome Madam on stage. I think we can do it better. I know breakfast is good. Thank you very much, Mr. Tete, for that very impressive introduction. And I think I'd like to know that lady, too, whom you've been talking about. <laughs> Good morning. 
Good, out. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming in so early to hear my uh, keynote address. The topic we're going to discuss today is so familiar to all of us. I think some of us can even yawn when someone talks about financing and obstacles for financing SMEs. And SMEs as the engine of growth for Uganda. SMEs this and SMEs that. We are all of us SMEs in our various capacities. And we have all struggled with the issue of finding appropriate financing. On the other hand, the financing houses of Uganda will say they're ready and willing to finance our enterprises. That is what they're here for. But they can't find the kind of projects or activities that they're able to finance. So what I'd like us to discuss today, what I invite you to consider this morning, is how can we start a conversation between us as SMEs, the financing houses, the government regulators, and the international uh, NGOs and other uh, financing partners who come to Uganda. I'm fortunate in that I've spent time in each of the sectors as a private individual in Uganda and an international financial organization, the World Bank. I've spent time in government, as you all know, and I'm also involved with uh, financing houses here in Uganda as um, members of the board. So I think I can see the elephant from all sides. I can see the trunk, I can see the legs, I can see the tail, and I can see the belly. If we just do a very quick background of Uganda, we all know our hype. We're landlocked at the center of Eastern Africa. We're the midpoint of four major ethnic groups, the Bantu from the south, the Swahili cultures from the east, the Nilotics from the north, and the Congolese uh, 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 ethnic groups from the west. They all come together in Uganda. We've got more than 40 tribes, I think more than 40 languages, and we all live in harmony together. Kampala is closer to each of the other five, now six, East African community capitals, except for Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, uh, when they're looking at each other. But otherwise, Juba, Kinshasa, Bujumbura, Kigali, Nairobi, for, uh, apart from Dar es Salaam, and Dar es Salaam, apart from Nairobi, we are closer to all those capitals. So you'd think that with our owning a, a good share of Lake Victoria, with over 30 million people in a geographically inducive environment and within the monetized framework. We have no uh, physical barriers for the people living around uh, Lake Victoria, where the agricultural food basket of uh, East Africa, we import more food to the other countries than they uh, export to us. We have the opportunity and the capacity to be the regional hub for trade and investment since we're also party to COMESA and the Africa Free Trade Agreement. We all know our priority sectors, agriculture and agribusiness, manufacturing, especially agribusiness support and supply of uh, certified inputs, the services, tourism, hospitality, logistics and warehousing, since we're in the center of Eastern Africa and we're in the center between, let's say, Cairo and Cape Town. And what brings us here today as financial intermediaries to the real sector? That background is all taken for granted. So what is our deal objective today? How can we get affordable, sustainable financing for viable, sustainable SME businesses and projects? Affordable is very important when you're thinking of financing. If you, there's all the financing one can get, I'm sure, if you're willing to pay 30 or 40% interest, isn't there? And you can do any SME, SME business if you don't have to worry about it being sustainable. So affordable financing for sustainable, viable projects, I think those adjectives are very important for us when we are considering 
the financing of our projects and enterprises. Um, I'd like to put up a chart which I call the structural transformation of Uganda or the virtuous circle of Uganda. Uh, Grace? Maybe we'll come back to that. But it shows, oh, okay, so it's on the, it's on the, it's, it's gone up. I call this the virtuous circle, where we can see how different parts of our economy all come together and how the financing links through all the sectors. If we want to unlock constraints, how do we accelerate the growth and monetization of the economy to the benefit of all? How do we formalize agribusiness? How do we put it on the map? How do we diversify our exports at the individual level? For that, we need to increase the effective demand. Everybody would like three meals a day. Everybody would like universal health care. Everybody would like a new car, a new house. But the demand must be effective. We need to improve our incomes. And in, and in improving household income, it means we improve domestic resources, uh, taxes, if I can use the four-letter word, uh, improve taxes, we do less external borrowing, the government borrowing uh, requirement goes down. It means that they can then get more loans for, for transformation, accelerate project implementation, and again go back to unlocking the constraints infrastructure being one of them, uh, health and education being another. So we're all dependent. It's a circle, and we can't break out of it. And we have to look at this and recognize that the SME sector is the engine to create jobs, generate tax revenue, and increase effective demand for our products and services. Because uh, I looked at some charts earlier there were three charts in total um, from various years in Uganda. And it shows that the SMEs account for fully over 90% of the household uh, labor market. They contribute to over 50% of the income and various other percentages which we'll go into another time. But just to show that SMEs are key. And so that's why I think this is a very, very timely uh, discussion. So if SMEs are key, how do we go about financing, remember as I said, affordable financing for viable projects? If we look at the existing modes of financing, we've got the traditional commercial banks, we've got the NGO financing houses, we have development banks like Uganda Development Bank, we have the SACOs and the upcoming fintechs. We have our family and friends. We have our retained earnings from our own labor. And increasingly, there's private equity or partnerships with local or foreign financiers to do what they call special purpose vehicles, where you create an entity to benefit each other and part way after an agreed time. So, if we look at all of these areas, why don't we have more loans? Why don't we have more affordable financing, whether loans, whether partnership, whether grants for the SMEs, whom, as we know, can be a very profitable sector? I'd like us to discuss some things, start a discussion on some of the obstacles what they call the non-tariff obstacles, to trade non-tariff obstacles to affordable financing. First of all, all of us stakeholders, financiers, sponsors of projects, government regulators, and other stakeholders, we must change our mindsets. There is no free lunch for anybody. We cannot look for free financing. And we cannot, if we are financing houses, look for 100% proof sponsorships to take up. We need to come together in a spirit of 
mutual, shall I say, we must not untrust each other. If we're a financing house, we must see what is the difference between expecting a very high collateral so that if it fails, mm -hmm, I'm covered. If we're a sponsor, we must not say, um, let me sign for this loan, take the money and run. I remember some years back, I was listening to the radio and they were interviewing people at KCCA officers who had been given money for a youth enterprise development fund. And the lady at KCCA said, I was, she said this in the vernacular, but I'll translate it into English. She said, in order to develop, we must get rid of a tendency to say, just get the money and disappear. We all have to stay in the arena. We have to recognize that SMEs of Uganda are the engine to growth. And therefore, we need to adapt our lending and borrowing to our peculiarities. We have to respect the rule of law and contract. That is to respect each other as partners or as participants in financing. Borrowers must respect lenders. Lenders must respect borrowers. The regulators must regulate in a way that it will rather implement the regulations in a way that improves and sustains and forwards our development. Because as I'm sure most of us in this room know, we're mostly uh, financially uh, savvy and, and knowledgeable. We have all the laws and all the regulations we need, don't we? Now, how do we publicize those regulations? How do we interpret those laws? How do we take advantage of the many, many incentives available that most of us don't know about? We have to take the long view. If you have a six-year project, it's no use looking for an overdraft facility to finance it, is it? Because it will turn out to be very, very expensive. We all of us have to take the long view as financiers and as financed people. Because if we do so in the context of Uganda, there will be a cost of adjusting the parameters for SME peculiarities. But we must remember that enabling these SMEs to become financially literate and financially savvy in the long run will reduce the cost of borrowing. A lot of the cost of borrowing right now is due to uncertainties on both sides. Uh, the finances, we need to see how to partner with borrowers so as to ensure a win-win. We need to focus on the cash flows, expected cash flows, and understand where they're coming from and understand their probability of happening. Because money is what makes the economy go round. And as uh, financial intermediaries, the main focus is to make sure the financial framework operates alongside your borrower's operational framework. The sponsors, we, again, I'm an SME too, we must make a thorough self-analysis when we're looking for financing. What are we entering into? What do we need this financing for? How will the expected outcome enable adequate, timely payback cash flows? If we can't determine that, then maybe that activity is not one we should look seek financing for. It's something we should build up on our own through our own retained earnings and maybe grants from our parents or other family members, which I'll come to in a minute. See, what kind of financing do we need? Not just what is available. I need uh, 100 million shillings for a project. What is a project? Is it a school? Is it you want to pay 
uh, university education for your uh, graduating son or daughter? That is fine, if that's what you want to do. And because when they graduate, they will come into the business and, and help you expand the business. But it will take them three years to study. Two, three years after that to find their feet. So looking at a six, seven year project, how are you going to finance the 100 million shillings over that project lifetime? Or oh, is it for trade finance to go to Dubai and bring back uh, some essential uh, co consumables? Well, if you've timed your demand right, sure, that's a quick in and out. You paid back in, um, in a year, less than a year. But you see, you need to make sure that the demand is effective. We all want the nice things, but are they affordable? Is your, can your market afford it? S stepping back to uh, in activities for a minute, the most sure fire sectors is the one where you're dealing with inelastic demand. People have to eat, people have to clothe themselves, people need shelter. Maslow's three areas of demand, if you remember uh, Economics 101. Food, clothing, shelter. You can never go wrong with those. But if you want to borrow money to set up a, a, a shop to sell French perfumes, you put, need to put in a big risk factor. And we also must avoid the Me Too syndrome. When I was a young child during the Amin era, oh, that's when people came out of government and started, you know, to what they do, Nekore um, self-employed. One lady would start baking bread, then everyone started baking bread. One person would start sewing school uniforms, everybody started sewing school uniforms. I'm sure you've seen it more recently. One person started exporting flowers, how many flower export companies came up? One person built an apartment block. Whee! Everybody builds apartment blocks. We must do the cost benefit analysis. As stakeholders in our enterprises, we need to sweat the details, if I may borrow from General Motors. We need to sweat the details. We need to do the paperwork, which is what the financiers also need to look at. And they need to help us do the paperwork. Record keeping, realistic assumptions, all this goes into our cash flow forecasts. And we have to discuss this with anybody whom we want to finance us. If we try to hide things from them, and when I'm saying we, it's not just the people in this room, it's all borrowers, wherever we are. If we try to hide things from the financiers, taboo. If the financiers look at our projects and say, mm, I'm not sure, sure about this, but the collateral is good. Uh -uh. Trouble down the road. Collateral for fin finances. You need to look at the collateral, but also look at the cash flows. Dissect the cash flows. Are they realistic? If they are, maybe you can take, maybe you can uh, reduce the collateral assumption. What is it for? Is it an area where there's an assured, effective demand? How formalized is your SME client? Do they need help in starting a book of accounts, registration, uh, tax, tax, getting tax IDs, and so on? Maybe this is where you can help them. It's tedious, but it pays you back. It really helps you in KYC, know your customer. And for us as borrowers, we look at interest rates. And you say, oh, that interest rate, it's a bit high, but I'm sure I'll manage. How do we know? Repayment periods. Maybe it's easier, maybe it's more beneficial to take a longer payback period. You pay more interest in the long run, but you'll be more comfortable with the repayment schedules. Food for thought. This is kind of, these are just ideas I'm tossing out, and one needs to customize to one's peculiar circumstances. Grace periods. This is something we, we can and should always look at. 
Because when you're starting a project, when you're starting a business, that is when the cash flow is most restrained. So if you can get a good enough grace period, then your chances of success are much better. And a word to our foreign-based financial supporters. If we come in with grants to a lender or to a borrower or to a sector, we should give those just as much rigorous examination as if they are, not, they are going to be repaid. It will help the, the borrower or the recipient. Because if they get used to grants as a way of life, then that is also not sustainable. When I was in government, let me share this with you. When I was in government, the World Bank had a, had a project for innovation, IT innovation, supporting IT uh, innovators who are mostly young people. And they did wonderful things in the five years of the project. Some really remarkable applications and innovations came up. Then at the end of the five years, I happened to be in office, and there was a suggestion the World Bank should increase that project for another five years. So someone said, but after five years of business support, shouldn't someone now be able to stand on their own feet? And uh, one of the young people said, yes, but the government has refused to, there has no money to finance us. So the meeting asked, why should the government continue financing you? Can't you go to the open market now and get financing? You know what they said? Uh-uh, they were still our ideas. <laughs> For them, that is how they viewed private equity firms. A partnership was stealing of the idea, not receiving of project financing. If you want financing, you have to give something up. You, have to, you can take all the legal uh, frameworks, but you have to give something into the partnership. You cannot continue to expect government or an NGO to continue financing you blindly. On the side of the regulators and the policy makers, I wrote down some agencies that assist or are instrumental in financing of projects. I got to eight, then I said, let me stop here. Because what I realized is uh, some of those agencies, I only knew them when I was in the ministry. I never met them before. And I'm sure there are others whom I don't know about. I'm looking at the Uganda Investment Authority uh, as the overall uh, facilitator, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, who brings corporations to life as legal entities in their own right, Uganda Revenue Authority in Nakawa, over knows them. NEMA, National Environmental Management Authority, Environmental Compliance, uh, things like we all know about the wetlands and burning of forests. But how about environmentally sustainably doing your projects? Uh, when I attended a couple of the COP annual meetings, I saw there's a big disconnect between the developed world and the developing world. I chaired some sessions with the Danish minister uh, responsible for financing energy projects. And in his country, I don't know if it's still the same, but at the time it was the Ministry for Housing and Energy. Why? Because being a northern country, heating is a very big factor. As I'm see, you can see what's happening now with the gas prices and oil prices in the wake of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, it was a very, very important house, uh, heating of housing. So they put it with housing. For us, we put it with minerals. But in both sides, all areas, we must see that this is sustainable. Because if it's not sustainable, our projects will suffer from very high uh, gas prices, very high transport costs, uh, it, uh, it will read, eat into people's ability to afford our products if you need a lot of energy to produce your product, and so on. Another one is the directorship of citizen 
citizenship and uh, immigration control, work permits, visas, and so on. The lands ministry, land ownership verification. For most of us, our land is our bank, is our pension, is our everything. Since we're not yet into uh, the capital markets, and I'll discuss them very briefly. The Uganda National Bureau of Standards for standards, guidance, and certification. One of our issues as SMEs is standardization of standards. If we are a, hold a bakery, it's no use one batch of cakes being good and the next batch being substandard. No. Your customers would, would expect a certain minimum standard, and this has a cost. And then there are other various ministry departments, but many of them don't know us, and we don't know them. So in closing, and in, uh, and in uh, concert with Prudential's overall holistic uh, approach to the business of insurance and financing, I would propose we, this is the beginning of a discussion between finances, banks, SACO's uh, representatives, uh, NGO representatives, the government, uh, the Bank of Uganda, because the Bank of Uganda, for instance, has the agricultural credit facility, which is supposed to, to give low-cost uh, loans through the banks. So if I get such a loan through my bank, it's not actually from my bank, it's from the Bank of Uganda who's getting it from the government or from a donor or development partner. But how can we make sure that those loans become sustainable, that the businesses they finance do become a long term? I'd like to see all of those agencies together with you, all the stakeholders, and say, OK, each agency to say, this is what I do, this is what I guarantee, this is what I help in. And we can say, well, I didn't know you did that. I didn't know you did that. Why is this not happening? Why is this not happening? Why is that happening? And to see how can we overcome the obstacles? Because the obstacles are not paper. We don't have, uh, we don't, there's no regulations that we need or any, any new, 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 new uh, frameworks. It's just how can we use what we've got sustainably to come together to see how we can all benefit. In my time as a minister, I saw so many countries in Africa where I would see something and I'd say, oh, how do you do that? They said, oh, we learned it from Uganda. I said, oh, really? Okay. I, I remember one West African country I went to and they had, it was well, supposedly a uh, semi-arid country, but they were producing rice like no one's business. And I said, what's this rice called? It's really, you know, it's, it's drought resistant, it's X, Y, Z, it's, and they said, we got it from Uganda. I said, Uganda? Yes, it's called Nerica, don't you know? Has anyone here ever heard of Nerica rice? Huh? It's doing great guns in Senegal, I can tell you. And what is Nerica? It was, when I came back, I found it was new rice for Africa, developed in Japan and pirated in Uganda. And now bringing benefits to the rest of Africa. Go figure, thank you. Uh, I think she deserves a larger round of applause. Thank you very much for that keynote address. Uh, key to this is uh, access to affordable financing. Uh, over the last couple of days, a lot of, a lot of us have become experts on financing uh, because of what we've been seeing in the news, especially on Twitter. So if you are tweeting, use the hashtag Pro Knowledge Series. So now we've, get, we've gotten into the panel discussion part of this conversation. I would like to invite Sam Setumba uh, to come forth. He will be leading, he will be the moderator. Sam will then invite our panelists for today uh, to lead the conversation. So over to you, Sam.
Thank you. Thank you very much. My, uh, let me stand here for the beginning. My colleague, the MC. It's a pleasure to be the moderator for the first of this series. I've been a journalist for 22 years, and I have had the SME story lamented over. I hope today we, will, we are going to find some working solutions. And uh, taking it from uh, our former minister, she spoke about uh, many things. Uh, she was just touching a few things. A few takeaways as we begin our discussion. Uh, for the financials, taking a long view. For the SMEs, self-analyze. Do Sarah homework. I call it homework about what you want to do. Get the market in right. Who are you going to, um, who's going to buy? Invest right. She gave an example of food. There's always demand for that. Don't copycat. Sweat the detail. That one I'll keep. Realistic forecasting. And of course, um, there was an element about private equity, which requires that you give something. Those for me were my personal takeaways as we're going to discuss. Now, let me invite my panelists. And um, our discussion adds to the uh, theme, investing and financing opportunities for SMEs to unlock Uganda's potential. Let me invite uh, first Mr. Tony Otowa, CEO Stanbic Incubator. You're welcome. A long time ago, we used to, I used to work with Tony. Now he's the CEO. Um, <laughs> it's great networks, yeah? Let me invite uh, Mr. Miss, Mrs. Maxima Musmenta, CEO Livara Cosmetics. <laughs> Let me also invite Dr. Gudula Naiga, Chairperson Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Association. And finally, I've been told uh, Mr. John Walugembe is in the room, uh, the boss at the F SME Federation of Uganda. Is he around? Not yet. Okay, he's joining us later. Sitting in for Mr. Stephen Asimwe, uh, the CEO for Private Sector Foundation of Uganda. I've been given this seat, but I prefer to stand here. Hope, it, hope it's okay, uh, my panelists. Let me just, as they relax, let me just uh, share some latest statistics I, I, I gathered this morning. According to the latest State of the Economy report from Minister of Finance, approvals of loans uh, went up by 59% since January. So the approvals were wishy-washy because of uh, COVID and the, the question of risk and all that. So the banks are starting to unfold but where is the money going? 60% of this 59, 60% basically of the approvals go to personal loans and trade. So maybe the SMEs in the trade area, they are the ones who are getting most money. But the biggest chunk actually is going to personal loans, salary loans. Eh? The next 14% goes to construction and real estate. And then, thirdly, 10% to business. These are called business loans. The typical SME, I guess. Only 10% of approvals. So you can see why uh, Prudential is uh, uh, in this kind of discussion today. And uh, our keynote speaker uh, touched it a little bit of why the banks are not uh, very keen on lending to SMEs. And those are, those are facts and realities we are dealing with uh, today in the room. Of course, outside agriculture, SMEs employ more people than all the other companies, the, 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 the large ones. So they are a force to reckon with. However, that, that age-old question of financing. And today we're talking about investment also. So let me start with um, Maxima. I like your smile. I see it on, on social media there. Uh, very good. Um, the energy you exude, uh, I guess, comes with the brand. Well done. Um, let me start with you. Um, 
give us a there and then tell us how did you harness investment and financing opportunities to make that company be what it is. Okay. So Livara is a manufacturer of natural and organic cosmetics, specifically for natural hair and our African skin. We manufacture best mainly with on shea butter, and then we retail our products in exclusive Livara shops and salons that we started in 2017. Uh, for me to start Livara, first of all, I'm an electrical and petroleum engineer. Graduated with a first class degree, and I was part of the initial team that built your Kira EV. So I was in charge of the DC DC converter, which you call the dashboard in Lehman terms. That was my technical expertise on that project. So anyway, to start Livara, like Peter mentioned, everyone has a side hustle of sorts, right? Now for me, when I was in Congo, um, first of all, going to Congo, I had relaxed hair. Three months down the road, I, cut, I need to do retouch. So I go to these salons. Uh, they were being run by black people, but they were owned by French people. So in the heart of Point Noir, which was the oil city, um, downtown Congo, very high-end place. I go to this salon, and I go ask to have my hair re retouched, and I'm chased out because they couldn't work on my African hair in an African salon in Congo. It didn't make sense for me. Uh, I go to two more salons, same story. So I go to a barber shop and chop off my hair, um, really down, like his, like <laughs> Mr. Sa Samuel. <laughs> Samuel, right there. So I just got pissed, chopped it off. Two months down the road, I need to start managing my hair because it was growing. Look on the market, there were no products. First of all, 98% of the products on the market in Congo were imported from Europe. Like already that's a very bad price issue. The cost was high, it was just not right. Then I look and there were no products for me with African hair on the Congolese market. We used to travel a lot. The products that were available for us were branded having raw materials from Africa, shea butter from Ghana, coconut oil from Mombasa, but they were not made here. You know, so again, I was just a no I, I move off annoyance. That's what sparks my innovation and growth. So I got pissed. So I started researching, researching. Shea butter is available in Africa, only grows in Africa. It's a billion dollar industry, but we are taking $200 million. That's just not right. So I started planning to leave my job, five months into my job, <laughs> to come back and start manufacturing. So on doing research, Uganda Investment Authority, in order for you to become an investor, you needed a minimum of $75,000 cash to get the investment license. So I started getting my targets. Um, I used to earn $10,000 a month, net average. So I started planning. I need to travel the world. I need to get exposure. I need to get experience. I need to experience the high life and the low life before I leave. So I made my goals. I need $75,000 cash to get an investment license. I registered all this online, meanwhile, before I stepped foot. So that's how Livara literally started. There was a clear gap, clean, and I was working. So I was saving up to get the money I needed before I started. Then I did a lot of research. Uh, Honorable Chuan mentioned, we don't, most of us don't put in the sweat. Now for me, because I knew I was leaving my security to start in some oblivion in Uganda that I have learned through my seven years here is really tough. Um, I needed to plan. So I, my $75,000 would have taken me for four years if at all nothing ever happened for me. I had planned that out. So I did my market research. Whenever I'd get vacation, I would come here and look around for the opportunity, see how sustain, sustainable it is. Is the tree really available in the quantities that I need? Um, Uganda Industrial Research Institute, I got um, incubation right at the institute because I needed to save up on my cost. If I were to start a factory by myself in my small area, then the cost would be really high. So I looked for, I discussed my project after writing it out with the elders in the industry, uh, one, of my, one of my grandmothers. 
um, Teresa Mbire. She's the one who introduced me to Uganda Industrial Institute. Just got me a meeting. After the meeting, she told me, so you either go, make yourself worthwhile, or you embarrass me. That's why she told me at the gate of the institute. So I had to go with my business plan, pictures, and you know, prove that I am worth being incubated. Um, so that's how I kind of harnessed my costing initially to cut it down. That way, when I come back, I'm not hit by the shock of lack of finances at the start. Because for sure, I was not going to take bank loans. Ugandan bank loans are still very archaic, the banking system. They need collateral land with a population of over 74% being young people. Honestly speaking, where are people going to get land from? You know, that's a big issue I have with banks. Anyway, so after that, <laughs> um, so I didn't have my own land. So honestly, I I'm not going to go to my parents to start asking for land. My parents are the type who told us after S6, you're on your own. Like their support is done. So we had to look for um, government scholarships. All of us children, six of us, went on government scholarship because my mom boldly told me, after this, you're done. But she wants you graduated with a first class. She wants you earning your own job, and she has a shopping list. So she'd come to you to support her business, yet she's not supporting you at all. So we all had jobs on campus. We all had government scholarship, and we all minded our own business somehow but we used to report to them up to today so that's a kind of parenting <laughs> i had so also my children wash my car every day to earn 500 shillings for their <laughs> food <laughs> anyway so that's how i have literally started moving then the other things that honorable chuan was mentioning um record keeping because i'm a scientist i believe in order and one plus one is two so I'm very strict on those things. I employ some key people to help me manage my growth. So my books are really well kept. When you go to the bank to even get a simple overdraft, they come and ask you, do you have audited accounts? Do you have, you know, like what's your cash flow um, trajectory? Recently, we, were, we are opening a branch in Bugolobi and I need about 400 million shillings to finance the project, setting up a salon and shop. So I went to the banks and I asked them, so I have my cash flow. We've been doing well for the past seven years. Can you give me an unsecured loan? <laughs> the bank <laughs> said that they could not give me money even with my books. I have banked with Stanbeck <laughs> for all these years. But the guys told me, no, you're very this. <laughs> really? Anyway, I, we have savings. We figured <laughs> we would use those and move forward. So our banks won't support you fully if you don't have collateral. But eventually, I managed to squeeze them, and they helped me somewhere with an unsecured <laughs> loan for six months. But after complaining and really going, I almost became abusive. I, was, you know, I put up a show all just to get support. But they... <laughs> They succumbed to my show, and they gave me something that I needed. You have to fight for what you believe in, right? But my books really helped me, because I started complaining, you can't be this archaic in such a situation. Meanwhile, I had tried getting a loan from a U.S. bank, hmm? just to see the process, to compare, because I needed email backing to prove my point. They were offering me $50,000 at 5.5% interest per annum, unsecured, because I have a good idea. And because our goods are traded on Amazon, they were ready and willing. Hmm? So when I told them, <laughs> I have evidence. But you see, our environment is you know, different. But of course, I understand you, given the recent issues in the papers of people defaulting. It's OK. It's understandable. But the thing is, our cases are different. Maxima. You know? But uh, that's it. So that's how I've had this. <laughs> right. It was deliberate for me to make you speak fast. <laughs> to give us the actual picture, um, when she says the banks are tricky, it's a, it's a personal experience. Oh, yes. And uh, I do believe that um, maybe some people get money from the banks in different ways. I want to be positive. But as uh, um, Madame Maria Chwanka spoke, uh, said, 
it's a conversation that maybe starts now and continues. The banks also have structural issues. They are regulated. They provision for loans. And there are all those realities. So maybe we can find a middle ground. I don't think we can exhaust those solutions here, but this is the beginning. This is the first of the cities. Let me, Tony, I'll come to you last. Uh, let me move to... Um, <laughs> the bank. Nothing. No, no, nothing personal. I'm, I'm your friend, Tony. Uh, let me turn to Dr. Naiga. Uh, she's the chairperson of Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Association and uh, Women Entrepreneurs Exchange Network. Financing for women. Women are very, and we have one there, women are very entrepreneurial and yet they face the same challenges as men, but to some extent for them, they are exacerbated. Uh, what's your experience with financing for women? For those whom you have seen financed, how has it happened? Today we don't want to lament, we want to be solutionist. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much, moderator. I want to thank Honorable Chiwanuka. But I wanted to find out from Honorable Chiwanuka, how would you feel if someone meets you and says, the Minister of Finance today, that you are the Minister of Finance? That's what the moderator has just done. Formerly, I was the chairperson of Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Association. That is three years ago. I'm glad I can still be remembered for that. I am Professor Goodla Naiga Basaza. I'm the managing director and founder of Goody Incubation Center. Goody Incubation Center has been in existence for the last 11 years. We work in 27 districts. We operate in 500 parishes and 50 divisions of Kampala, Mukono, and Wakiso. We are in two white meat value chain linkage. We work with youth at the base of the pyramid who raise meat and we sell it to the youth in the urban. We now have a network of 112,900 youth. We are a business of a turnover of 10 billion annually for now. So I want to speak in my own right also as a woman entrepreneur because I've also gone through that experience. I have a very good idea. When I was starting my business, I was very excited. It's a social business. It was a good thing. I'm so excited about this and I had made savings. I, 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 I was a university donor. I had a salary assured like she did. But one thing I notice is that not everybody is excited about agriculture. So when I went to people, I, had, I know how to write very well. I'm a doctor of ICT. I'm the first doctor of ICT in this country. I know how to write my things. But somehow I wouldn't convince anyone that I can get a loan and service it, even when I was very organized. The issue being that of course, these institutions that have money, they have shareholders, they have their own reasons why. So I went back and looked at my savings. I had worked long enough. I had worked for about 10 years and had made savings. And my savings were in cows. I come from a farming background. My parents, we had 12 children, and my dad always had cows. And whenever we were going to school, for us, that was our ATM. He called someone, picked the cows, and we had money. So I grew up knowing that is the family ATM. So whatever money I made wherever I was working, I was putting in that family ATM. I always had cows. And any time I want money, I just on that sell that cow, and money comes. So I started with my own savings to do my business. And I see that a number of women are actually employing that different ATMs. Some people have forests. That is their ATM. Some people now have shares, that is their ATM. So in terms of accessing financing, I think the institutions are looking for those who have money to give money. That is what I think. It's difficult to give you money when you have no money. So you need to prove that you have money so that you can get money. And how do you prove that you have money to get money? You have got to start and do something and keep moving. And we have very big dreams, but at times it's good to break the dream into 
small manageable steps. So that you ask money for this step, after that step, you ask money for the next step, when you become more credible. And I think it's also easy for you to manage that kind of money. The other thing I have learned along the way is that uh, it's good to trade in products. We are trading in white meat. If you are somebody who eats meat, most likely you have eaten our chicken, you have eaten our fish, you have eaten our rabbit, you have eaten our pork. However, it's also important to trade in services. I found it very nice to balance the two. I trade in products, but I also trade in services. I don't find much risk in services. I trade my brain. I trade, I am a writer, I'm an author. My books are making money for me even when I'm sleeping. Somebody is buying my book, I am making money. I find that more reliable as a source of income that I don't have to say today nobody is buying chicken, people are broke, the feeds have increased, things like that. So when we are doing business as a women and we are thinking about raising our financial capital, financial muscle to be attractive to different financing institutions, that one is very important. The other thing I have seen during my time at Uganda Women Entrepreneurs is pooling resources. And I think Prudential teaches us that to pool resources together so that we can achieve as one. As uh, women entrepreneurs, we have our own circle, the Women Investment Club, and we have all been saving there. And that is one place I can go to. Nobody asks me, sign here, sign there, bring who, bring what. I am already known, all the members know me, they know where I sleep, they can trust me. Of course, at times we forgive the institutions, they don't know us that much, but these people know us. Uh, right now I'm in six circles, and in all my circles I get money at 1% per month. So why wouldn't I keep saving there? So this is one thing I would encourage women to do. Find circles where you are known, where you are trusted, and keep the name. Keep that name because it's your name that will help you grow and become bigger. And uh, last on this matter, when you have a product, I, there is what I call ecosystem mapping. Look at other people that are interested in what you're doing. Today I'm dealing with youth, for example. How many other people are interested in the youth? They can reduce the cost of doing business with the youth. For example, the bank wants to bank the youth. I want to train the youth to do agriculture. Me and the bank will go together to the youth and we shall split the cost of training the youth. That is going to be extremely important, knowing who is in your ecosystem. And right now we are even seeing it with the ecosystem mapping and the value chain linkage. I know whom I'm supplying, I know whom I'm buying from. All of us don't have to borrow money. Today we supply 15,000 youth meat every day. And those youth don't have to have money. We give them meat at 48 hour loan. They are the ones who are roasting on the street. They don't have to have money, so they don't have to borrow. They pick the meat, after 48 hours, they return the money. So that's another way of financing. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, <laughs> Madam Maria Chuanuka mentioned those things. You see how they're coming back? Models. Uh, who do you sell to? Understand your market. They're being given as testimonies here. Maxima there so that says it's about hair, but it's not about just hair. It's about things, about if it's the ladies, about how they look, how they feel. It's emotive, they will pay. That kind of uh, conceptualization. That's what it takes. If you don't give it depth, you might suffer. Um, Tuna, I'm coming to you. Let me just briefly introduce um, and invite uh, Mr. John Walgembe. Uh, who is the, yes, just here. John, you're welcome. Oh, you're actually there. He's the chief at the SME Federation of Uganda. I think finally the SMEs have uh, someone to speak for them, family. If you want SME issues, you can go whatever you want, but you better go there. You better go there. You better dealing with SMEs. Let me come to Tony. Thank you. 
the point of 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 the When he went to this bank to get a facility, he got a facility to build a school. Now, when he got that facility to build the school, he was given the money, went, set up, and tried to build his school. A few months down the road, he turned it into a liquor manufacturing enterprise. True story. When the banks came to see how the loan is progressing because he had already begun manufacturing, everything is going right, they found he had diverted the purpose of the funding into something else. When they asked him why he had done that, he said, you see, with a school, the return on investment is quite worrisome as compared to the liquor situation. And again, the bank at the time wasn't really disappointed because they were still getting their money back. He's selling his booze and everything is happening. But I think also like the gods must have been on his side. We went through a lockdown, right? <laughs> and you know what happened? Schools closed. People were drinking liquor. But that is a story for another day. I, I just wanted to highlight that story to talk about the situation that any lender has when dealing with entities that have borrowed money and the need for us as businesses to be very steadfast when handling money. The reason I asked my brother Mukasa to stand is we've been in the trenches together for some time and he has a very wide history, a long history with his time at Enterprise Uganda training local businesses all over the country. And the same theme that Honorable talked about, Honorable Chiwanka, the same thing how we manage our businesses and finances is very important. Very important. I can give you money, and trust me, if you are not disciplined enough, that's a problem. So, at the business incubator, or how we set it up, or why we set it up, it was just to answer that one question. Why is it that if you went to URSB today, you will have over a thousand businesses registered and opened, but if you went back to URSB two years from now, the same day, you'll find that hardly 10% or 15% of those businesses are still operational. Why is that the case? Now, a lot of the time, we will say it is access to finance. But I'll say one thing. There is so much funding available. But it is how attractive your business entity is to attract or to pull in that financing. I have worked and supported the training of close to 1,800 to 2,000 businesses, SMEs. Some great stories, some have really struggled, but the interesting opportunity there is how many entities come to us looking for businesses that they can pay. Now, I'm not talking about going to a bank. And again, also, Maxima is a very interesting person. I grew up with Maxima, we were neighbors for over 18 years. Yeah, direct neighbors. So I understand where she's coming from. So, so, I don't, so, so we're going to manage this elsewhere. But <laughs> if you look at the attractiveness of businesses to financing, it is a very crazy concept. Now, I'll tell you one thing. And again, I also wanted to say Honorable seemed like she took my, 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 my uh, presentation because she was speaking about most of the things that I was going to mention. But today, if you look at SME financing, most entities are going away from traditional financing, which is the bank. And I will tell you for a fact, if you went to Europe, most businesses, startups, do not go for money from banks. They go through or get it from a lot of sources. Venture capital funds, 
very amazing new way of sourcing financing. Because I'll tell you one thing, not all people in banks understand your drive or your tenacity or your product. But you could find an angel investor somewhere with a hell lot of money and he's looking for somewhere to play around with his money. Those are opportunities there. But then also the idea of equity. You see, and doctor, you will, you will, you will prove me wrong. When we Ugandans start a business, you understand? If I come in and I want to, to, to just take 20% of your business and put money into it and support you with operating it because I understand how to manage businesses, the first thing you will say is, Azekuba business young. True story. Yeah? Azekuba business young means he has come to steal my business. Tete, I'm sorry you're new and uh, I've just been told I have to translate. I think that we'll have to top up some of these uh, uh, services. But anyway, when you think about it, we are so emotional when it comes to our businesses that we put passion and emotion above a lot of logic. And I'm glad Maxima talks about one plus one because if I'm an investor and I want to support you in your business journey, I want to see your business grow, and I've come and said I have 100 million here, give me 20% stake in your business, I will support you with the marketing, I will also lead you to other entities that can make us grow bigger and faster. If you have a mindset that is about your business growth, that becomes an opportunity. The reason why we have businesses that are struggling to go beyond generations in Uganda is because of one very crucial thing. We do things that only live within our lifespan. And this is a fact. I, I think we're all, if, if we are to, to, to really get solutions, I think we have to be inconveniently truthful today, right? If you look at most Ugandan businesses, the moment the owner dies, what happens? I can mention names, but I wouldn't want to mention names. But we all know that if you want to see your business going beyond you, it ceases to be about you and ceases to be about legacy and wealth and the future. So when you're building a business, you're not building it for yourself. But a typical Ugandan businessman, the moment his business has started doing well, the first thing he does is buy a big car. Because for him, things are moving. And then the car becomes a cost to the business, taking a lot from the business. And then he goes on to, <laughs> for the micro businesses, and a lot of the time when you go out of uh, the city, in many of the places that I have worked with the businesses bef uh, before, a guy starts running a good business, the next thing is getting a second wife. So if you start thinking about all of these things, and we are not truthful about them, you will find that it's very difficult for your business to live or survive beyond you. So my question was really about financing and the different financial options. Now, I'm again very excited that uh, Honorable talked about our immediate family and friends. But I remember Tete was laughing and saying, yeah, this is the best way to go. And I said, the default rate nowadays is making a lot of family and friends run away from us. <laughs> you lend a guy money, trust me, he'll even never come to a family function for the next two years. But let us remember that as Africans, in the spirit of Ubuntu, traditionally that is where the easiest capital has come from. You go to so many different family, friends, and, you know, get money and start a business. But I don't know whether it's either... Uh, globalization or, or, or the change in climate or whatever. I don't know. People have changed for some reason. So you find that that spirit of Ubuntu is going away. But one very key area is your pastor savings, and Maxima mentioned that, pa family and friends, and that is usually a great starting point. But then the external sources are really, really what lead us to that exponential growth. One of them is the grants. Guys, there's so many grants going around. We give out grants to so many businesses. We have a project with the French Embassy where we've been giving out grants for women and youth. But for you to win that money or to get that money, what does your business proposal look like? You know, whenever we ask businesses that have come onto the program if they are ready enough to start, one of the critical questions that we ask is, do you have a business plan? A business plan. Mr. Mukasa, you can, be, you, you can agree to that. Do you have a business plan? The guy says, business, but they tumble, I'm here, 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 I'm here
Meaning, the business has been moving for 10 years. You're asking me for a business plan. So, so now you're asking yourself, okay, does this guy know what working capital is, what uh, his uh, expenses, personal expenses are, or whatever? The guy says no. I will, I will tell you a very interesting story. There's a, 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 an, an entrepreneur runs a very nice big business. We usually track when you disappear for about a couple of weeks. We follow you up. So we follow him up. And we're like, but boss, two weeks, you haven't showed up. The guy said, you know, <laughs> after that module on financial literacy, I went back, I looked at my books. You know, I don't usually look at books because my partner manages that. And I realized, while I thought we were making money, we are actually not making money. So money comes into this port, then goes out to another port, and, 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 and when I confronted my partner, so why are you thinking that your business is making money because it's around for 10 years? You're actually not making any money. In today's youthful world, we call it vibes and mashallah. You're just enjoying, huh? but you don't know what's actually happening. So it's very important for you to understand that your business has to be legit, clean. Your business proposals have to be on point for you to attract that attention and money to it. But I just talked about venture capital funding, and uh, Samuel, I was told that uh, you're going to be very hard on me, so I'm going to just try and rush this through. Venture capital funding. In, in two minutes. In two minutes. Very important. It's the new way of funding. Think about most of the crazy African stories today, from Nigeria to Kenya to South Africa. It's VC funding that is leading to their growth, to their penetration into new markets, and to them getting to be known. So that's a very, very interesting point. But also business angels. I tell you, MFFF now is giving a lot of people who, who are like me and Sam getting to 45, our money, our 20%. But I'll also tell you that a lot of us do not have a proper plan for what to do with that money. But if you're a business like Libara, and you can articulate your story, you can articulate your business planning, I would gladly put my 20% into your business as a business angel. So those are also other sources of financing. But I think also what's very, very critical is also the idea of understanding that there are so many flexible options for you to attain services and financing for your businesses. If I wanted to own uh, or, 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 or have more fleet in my business to support with my transportation, there are so many avenues that you can actually use to access some of these support. Some of these companies like Toyota is uh, having you know, or has lease services. But all of these, like I say, have to be streamlined with a clean business plan, a clean business strategy, and a good story that articulates growth. That is the only way that we can see businesses getting a lot of financing into themselves. And I think it starts with us, the business owner. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Tony is a trainer. <laughs> Tony is a trainer. Even if I told the other three to keep quiet, he will train us <laughs> for two hours. And, but um, Stanbic uh, Incubator is there in case you need uh, uh, personalized training for your business. Uh, Tony and his team can do that. Let me move to John. John, Samuel, welcome. Someone just before you move on, I just wanted to mention it's free of charge and open to anyone. Okay, free of charge. That's surprising. Free of charge. You heard that. And the man is here. Don't let him leave the room without getting his contact. John, um, uh, we, we, we resolved today not to lament for 20, 30 years. We knew the problems of SMEs and financing, now we want to be solutionist. Uh, Tony here spoke about um, uh, venture capital in, and uh, those solutions, and I know you work with SMEs. Structurally speaking, for Uganda, what should be set right? Because we can sit here in the room and deliberate, and you go and move to do these things and you find obstacles that you did not expect. So John, structurally, for Uganda, what should be set right for us to be able to finance SMEs in uh, creative ways going forward? Okay. Uh, firstly, allow me to apologize. I came in late. Uh, I don't want to give the reason, but <laughs> please understand that due to logistical challenges, <laughs> could not be here on time. 
First of all, Sam, you have warned me against lamenting. So I fear you are insinuating that I'm the lamenter in chief or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so um, I want to say that um, I speak for small businesses, uh, but I'm also a small business owner because people may not understand. I'm a small business owner. I operate in this country. So a lot of the things that I say uh, because I run my business, you know, and I see how hard it is. Recently, we were with the Ministry of Trade, and she was saying, you know, we used to go for meetings with her. You tell her this and this and this, and says, John, no, the government of Uganda has the parish development model. Now she was, when we met the other day, she was saying, John, things are tight. <laughs> Registering a business, people just had to help me because they knew me, Amelia Chamba, but otherwise, there's no way I was going to succeed. So sometimes, some um, when we lament, it's because this is the feedback that we receive directly from the members. And after lamenting, the SME start whatever. In, John, you have said well. Continue. Hey, hey, hey. So if I, so I'm not going to lament, but I'll just say what the issues are first. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Mansa are about two SMEs only. Only. <laughs> Okay, first, most SMEs in this country are micro businesses. Means they have less than four employees and they make less than 10 million Ugandan shillings. This is the bulk of SMEs. You have a few small sized businesses, you have a few mid sized businesses, but not many. The bulk are at the base, they are survivalist in nature. You see a lot of women at that level, and they're running these businesses to pay fees and so on and things of that sort. My own mother was a micro business owner, by the way, and I saw what she went through, and so I identify with some of the issues. I don't think she was meant to be an entrepreneur, by the way, because she would donate things. Eh? Someone would be passing, oh, that girl looks hungry, please eat our on your soda and things of that sort. <laughs> so you <laughs> so you found that business wasn't doing as well as it it, it should should have it should have been doing. So these micro businesses are looked at by financial institutions as extremely risky and therefore financial institutions are averse to lending them money. They just don't consider them as viable uh, borrowers. Thankfully, there are new models now. You have digital lenders, you have circles, you have other people who are interested in this group. And you have some financial institutions, by the way, that have found innovative ways like group lending and so on of targeting this segment. I want to say that this is where the money is. For most of us who are here and you're a young person, you want to run business in Africa, don't focus on the elite like John. John is very calculative. Before I give you 10,000 shillings, you must offer value. But those micro businesses is where future growth is. And that goes to Prudential as well, in terms of insurance penetration. It's on this segment you need to follow, to, to focus, not on the elite. For us, we have options. I can buy my, my premium from wherever, you know, but this segment, I think, has a lot of potential and we need to focus on it. Now, why don't banks want to lend to them? They don't keep books. I mean, they don't keep books the way banks want them to keep books. This is also the other issue. We went and borrowed, we, all of us, because we went to school, we went to business school and so on. We want to insist to these people, you must record debit and credit. This is nonsense. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> we want this lady to know what has she brought in what has she paid out? Where are her assets? Where are her liabilities? We shouldn't get lost in extremely good English and lose the point. <laughs> One day I was doing mentorship for, we had a project many years ago to support fabricators. So we went and trained them. Mr. Mukasa is an expert here, how to keep books and so on. We even gave him a book to record. He left our book there and he got his piece of paper where he would record. Now, these donors went in 
first of all, they went in four big vehicles to go and see one fabricator, which wasn't a problem, but, you know, we went. And then we asked the man, where are your books? The man went in his coat, pulled out his car paper, and showed us. <laughs> and uh, the, the things were there. The man would explain, I received this much. I said, uh, after they said, we are very disappointed. Eh? This person is not keeping proper work. You know, I looked at this and said, now, this is a problem. This colonialist and dependence mindset is a problem. Also, for us small businesses, as Africans, now let me speak to us. We have good ideas, but we want other people to invest in those businesses. When you get your money, you don't put it in the business. You buy a plot. You marry a wife, like Otoa said, because that's where your... The Bible says, where your heart, where your, where? You, where your treasure is. You, can, you cannot say you have started a business, you want it, but you have not invested. You're looking for angel investors, some white people somewhere. You think these people, are, what, they are angel Gabriel or what? <laughs> <laughs> these people are extreme capitalists. <laughs> so, extreme capitalists. So, young person. If you believe in a business, start from where you are. I was not there when Honorable Maria was speaking, but I had something around relying on your family and friends. Now, you see people, you make juice, you say, the challenge I have is market access. I want to see how I can penetrate the US market through AGOA, African Growth and Opportunity Act. But your grandmother can't even take your juice. You yourself at home, you don't take the juice. <laughs> but you think in your head, <laughs> someone in California will take your juice through a goa. How? It's <laughs> not so possible. Start from where you are. They say, start from where you are with what you have to change the world. Stop thinking, stop complicating things. I see a lot of SMEs complicating unnecessarily. I want to see the managing director of Stanbeck. Okay? Why, what do you want to say? Well, we've developed an app which does exams for children and things of that sort. She will not, because the money she has, she's keeping it in custody on behalf of other people. So, this issue of running around from one bank to the other, thinking that there is some person who has money to give for free and is a bit naive that he won't interrogate things. W won't work, you know? I'm telling you because this is what I see every day. You go to Agago, you find someone needs 50,000 to run his business, but he's complaining. The challenge I have is market access. How? The market that you're talking about is the school next to you. You have to talk to the head teacher well. You have to be consistent. You have to deliver. You have to be honest. Hmm? This is the other issue. We are not trustworthy people. You lend someone. If they say if you want to lose a friend, lend them money. You lose the friend and the money. <laughs> <laughs> they avoid you. They stop coming for functions. They stop what? Now, if you can do that at family level, with 20,000, 50,000, me have lent money to people, and then the person pretended as if that transaction didn't take place at all. <laughs> <laughs> when they meet you, they start talking about politics, football, what? <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> we have a pending issue. I lent you money. <laughs> so, so, John, my takeaway from... Uh... I'm sorry for being verbose, but... Let me conclude by saying, <laughs> on the supply side, you also have problems. You, the financiers, you also have problems. One, you are offering too much debt. You talked about equity. There's also dishonesty, this whole private equities, whatever and stuff. Is, you know, these friends of us from the West, they use complicated words that an ordinary person does not understand. But it is not as good as it appears. There's the issue of dilution. You bring in equity and you're not organized, they'll dilute and exit you because this is capitalism. It's not a church. 
So before you bring in equity, you must be ready to cede some control in the business. The other issue that as a country, we have also not set a very good legal framework to support equity investors. So most of the funds that would invest in our businesses are domiciled out of Uganda. Why? You are a A1's capital gains tax. We are too hungry for money that we can't even wait. Before the food is put on the table, you're going with the sigiri, you're saying, give me one piece of meat. See? So we must create an environment that will encourage people to bring their money here, to invest in our businesses, and create a regulatory environment to ensure that our businesses are protected. Finally, digitalization is going to be a game changer. In the, in, if you look at now all these people, because, uh, you, uh, MTN is giving loans, everyone is giving loans, the banks are going to become redundant with their 30-page forms. <laughs> See? Because MTN is saying, we are seeing how you buy your time. We will, you have a loan limit of 50,000. They don't ask you where you stay. They don't ask you for your wife's number. They don't ask you a, ma a marriage certificate. <laughs> eh? They just give you the loan. You know? So, this is going to be a game changer. Thank you very much. Thank you. When John speaks, you need to listen carefully. You might miss the point with these illustrations, but he makes very good points. Uh, some of the takeaway. Digitalization, big data. True. If you're going to borrow, um, depends on which network. Maybe where were they? They are monitoring you. They know, they can see the money and say, okay, this one will give 200,000. And so on. So that is uh, one, for me, one uh, good uh, future, futuristic approach to lending to SMEs. There is something that has kept on coming up with all the discussions. And I wrote it, reputation. Reputation. Let me come back to you, Maxima. From your experience, how much does reputation hold if you're going to attract financing? Um, reputation is everything. You must... Where I come from, I've been raised naively. Black and white. There's no gray. They say that chiga are <laughs> that straight. So that's how I was raised. The first time I wanted um, to set up a salon, I needed some extra money. At that time, I didn't believe in debt from the banks or anything. So there are some people that I agreed with to come on board. But I did not do my due diligence. I simply believed whatever it is I was told, right? But later when things started changing, I started doing my due diligence. That's when I started finding out, looking for information, who is this person like? What have they really been doing in the past? Are they the right partner? You know, such questions. And from the interactions with simple people that they've worked with, I realized they were not the right partners for me, but it cost me so much. So reputation is key. In as much as people want to invest in you, it's also important for you to find out about the people that are investing in you. Because like Honorable Chuan had said, there's nothing that is free in this world. And most of the bad decisions we make, because we haven't taken time to put in the work to find out about these people, will cost us an arm and a leg. The other thing is, if I say that I'm delivering a service, I admire Java Cafe. There's an article I wrote about them. So I, I went to my first Javas, Cafe Javas in 2006, and I ordered a Cajun chicken meal. That's still my best meal up to today. The test has never changed. The presentation has never changed. Maybe they add a little mint on the side, but that's it. It's consistent. So for the reputation of Javas, I know for sure the Cajun chicken is the best. Same thing with us as small, in our small businesses. If we say we are going to give a product that maybe turns hair black or helps in hair growth, don't lie to people. Because the moment they find out that the thing doesn't work, the information leakage out there will be the worst publication, publicity for you. So when you say something is going to do ABCD, 
make sure it does ABCD and let it do ABCD for the longest time. Reputation is, just, is not just for us, the business owners, it's for the business as well and also the product or service that you offer. It's what will keep your light shining, right? Um, yeah, thank yeah. you, Max. Uh, and really, I, I, I cherish personal experiences. Let me go to Professor. You deal with children, you give them meat, and you give them, tell them two days, and then they pay. There's a bit of trust there. How critical is reputation to you? How, how, how do you use it to grow your, your business? Thank you very much. Our business would not exist if there was no reputation, there was no trust. We only exist on that. But again, there is, it is easier for us to talk about reputation for other people and not for ourselves. One thing that has affected trust for most of us in business, at times you want to get to the market, you price wrongly. I start by saying my chicken is 5,000, but in reality, I know that it's not 5,000. Once you have now come in as my customer, I want to increase. And when I increase, it means I'm not being honest. Because from the beginning, chicken was 5,000. But because I never did a cost-benefit analysis, I was never able to tell where is the break-even, which is my profit margin, what numbers should I play with. So I gave you a price to attract you. So when we are talking about reputation, as the business people ourselves, we must be able to keep our word all through. Even if it means losing a customer who will not afford our product, let us lose that customer and have one that will be consistent with us. The other important thing that I've seen in our network, it's a very big network. We have the youth in the rural who are producing the meat. We are selling this meat to the youth in the urban. So we have so many people holding us in trust. So knowing that when you default, you are defaulting for the entire ecosystem. There is somebody who grew the maize that fed the chicken. Everybody is trusting you. And to me, I think that's where we have to go back as a country, to have that trust. And if we have trust, all the money that we want, we shall get it. Our relatives used to give us money to trade, but now they can't trust us. So we are losing on equity that was not expensive, actually, because of lack of trust. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, there's so many things we could single out out of this, and uh, I encourage uh, Prudential to continue this series. We are just scratching the surface. To start with, um, I am a stickler to time. That's a reputational issue. Reputation. I don't want to go over time. It's, I've given. I've been given one hour for this panel, and we have 20 minutes left. The audience. You have the the trainer. John, the business person, but also trainer. And then you have uh, Maxima and Dr. Uh, Professor Niger, doers. Express your thought or your question in line with financing and, um, and SMEs. Uh, please don't give a speech, just maybe ask a question or, or give a thought. Okay, we have a hand here. Is there a mic, mic moving? Let's take him and the lady there. Uh, good morning. My name is Frank Fayo. I just have a question for Tony. Uh, we know that you're the guy we are bashing. Uh, my, my question is, why is it that a lot of financial institutions are still stuck to the brick and mortar ways of uh, verification uh, of loans and all these things, yet the same institutions have really innovated in every other area, apart from the part when they're giving out money? Uh, or is it, you know, a Bank of Uganda regulation or something? Uh, how come it has been very, very slow uh, to improve on that part? Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. I'm Yvonne Panga. I do business development consultancy and I'm also 
happy to be one of the Uganda Women Entrepreneurs and Business and Professional Women. My question goes to Dr. Goodravasaza, who is actually one of my mentors. She talked about service where a product might fail because service could be assured. As a business development consultant, my challenge has been getting our local people to appreciate consultancy value. So much so that once you have given the whole game plan, the proposal, you get the 30%, they look around and say, if pay Yvonne five million per month? No, I can get a campus to implement Yvonne's entire strategy at so much. The question is, how do you advise the business people here who are not in the product sector? Because the product sector is easier to manipulate, to handle financing, when even if their books of accounts could be showing that they have a tendency, they have a growth plan, the gaps in payments do not tally with the value that they give the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree with you. In my other life, I do professional counseling. And there's a, a pressing question there. Huh? That's service. Uh, sometimes when you say, okay, a certain amount, somebody says, you expensive. Another person says, I'm good. So yeah, that's a very, my question also. Let's take just two more and then we come back. Uh, we, Thank okay. you. My name is James Ngaviano. Uh, I run a company called Pretty Events. It is into the events management space. I want to thank Prudential for organizing this. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I subscribe to Prudential because, I'm, uh, because of the experience I've acquired for the last uh, more than 10 years. So I would like to urge the organizers that we need to educate the youth because I've learned that uh, most youth, they want quick things, but to become, uh, like, uh, I, I was subscribing for Prudential took me about nine years, so I realized that to subscribe to cater for even the life for my family when I'm, I'm not there, so it takes understanding. So we need to educate the youth so they are able to understand that they are not selfish enough, so uh, training should be emphasized so that we are able to help the, the youth who want quick things so that they are able to also catch up uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. We need a lady uh, to balance uh, these days uh, inclusiveness. Yeah. The lady, okay. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. The name is Nakandi Penina. I just appreciate you there for giving me this opportunity platform. I'm the founder of Persons with Disabilities in Business Uganda. My question goes to two key people. Mr. John, thank you for being brilliant and having that mindset that you're talking for SME. So, Mr. John, with our youth with disabilities, we do exist in our country. I would like you, if everybody is in this room, I believe everybody is a potential customer of a disability at one point. But we, youth with disabilities, we are lacking accommodative environment to maneuver in our business. For the case of Kampala City Council, when you move around, we are given a gazetted place for people with disabilities. But none of we with disabilities is operating in that place. It's people without disabilities are doing and working in that place. Because even in Kampala City, the toilets which are existing, they cannot give you that environment that you can do your business. The government of Uganda has done what it feels. So all companies and organizations here, thinking about the business, what is your take? We don't need money for funding, but we need accessibility for us to operate for the businesses. Because the cost we are incurring, it's doubling what we can. For example, today currently, if Penina, I have a wheelchair, and I'm moving from Kampala to Kasubi, I need to get someone to help me to enter the tax park. That is a cost. Then from there, and again to reach, if I'm to use a border B, it is more extra. Somewhere you use 3,000 Ugandan shillings, I'll end up using 10,000 Ugandan shillings. What is your take? 
to us to be in position to move into this business. Mr. Samuel, you have the incubator. I would like to know it from you. Is it accessible for us with disabilities? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Penina. Uh, Prudential, you see when you provide platform, you see what happens. Okay, let me come back to the panel and we wind up so we don't go too much out of time. I don't know where to start. Uh, there are specific questions. This, uh, let's start with the consultancy question. And uh, banks start to brick and mortar. Tony, you go first, then um, anyone will take the consultancy question in advice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fayo, uh, I, th I think there's a misconception because what's happening right now is that digital transformation is becoming the backbone of any financial institution anywhere in the world today. And we can see that happening not only in Uganda, but all over the world. So what's happening, for instance, with Stanbic, you can actually open up an account using your phone. You can open up, you know, you can, you can, you can access a loan using your phone. There's so many things that are happening within this space. But I think what's happening, like you've said, is probably the slow process. And again, it's a slow process on all sides, and mainly also a side of the customer knowing that this is actually available. But I think also a slow side on the side of the banks to be able to explain that this is actually available. So it's a two-way thing, but it's available, it's what's happening, it's just, I think, the pace which is uh, uh, taking, uh, 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 taking a slow process. Penina, I just want to say this with everyone listening. We have taken on the issue of people with disabilities as a critical issue at Stanbic. I will tell you that, first of all, with my employment, I now have set up a quota within my staff to cater for employees with disabilities. That's number one. Number two, we have made sure that all of our um, uh, facilities have the ability for people with disabilities to use and be comfortable. The fact that we have so many entrepreneurs coming into that space every single day, if you went there today, you'll find it full. We need to make it accessible for everyone. We believe in equity, we believe in the fact that everyone has the right to the same opportunities. And that is something that we have done. So if you come, you will actually see that we have put new ramps to allow for accessibility into the facility. But most important of all, it's also the quarter on the staffing and the people that we work with. So we are cognizant of that fact and we take it at heart as one of those critical areas. Thank you. John, the consultants of value. John is a consultant also, if you didn't know. Uh, give us, <laughs> throw him something there. Ha, Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne is, is, is my friend. As a consultant, why do you give out everything? Why do you write a strategy with everything? You leave some things so that they get stuck and call you. Otherwise, if you give... <laughs> no, because we, we, we know it. When people are designing websites, sometimes they give you some passwords and so on. Then when you bring another person and they are fidgeting, you have to call the original guy. Because has Coca-Cola given out the formula for salt? Has, have they given it out yet? Has Coca-Cola given out the formula for Coca-Cola? No. So as a consultant, as you're writing, at each stage you have to ensure that you leave some things for yourself so that in case they bring someone else, they lose direction and call you to come. That's it. Uh, do you want me to respond to? Yes, go ahead. Penina, I'm really happy. I'm, I'm, I feel so honored by what you just said. You know this work that I do for the Federation is purely voluntary. So when you say something like that, I feel extremely, extremely honored. And I would say this, one, I'm going to invest 200,000 in your business. <laughs> Two, as the lamenter in chief, <laughs> I am going to ensure that KCCA addresses these issues. We are going to work together to ensure that these issues are addressed by KCCA. And I'll make sure that happens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, final word from um, Professor, and then we come to Maxima and we wind up. Thank you. I will uh, supplement what John said about consultancy. I think what I have experienced is at times we are so excited as consultants with what we have to offer as a service, but the person we are offering this service at times has never experienced us and they don't know the value we are going to bring to them. We have to step back 
and ensure that we make them see the value. I'll give you a typical example in my own life. When I finished my PhD so many years ago, before some of you were born, I decided to join Uganda Matters University and it had three, that three quarters of its population were distance learners. And I knew that I was going to ensure that we can now learn virtually and everything, but I met resistance. Not that it was a bad thing. They are also gatekeepers to some of the things the consultants are proposing. You want to streamline the financial system. There is somebody who has been benefiting from the unstreamlined financial system. You need to be able to understand that they are gatekeepers before your service can come on board. I'll give another example of something that has happened to my company. Last year we had an inferno and we lost property worth one million US dollars. We had insured our property. We had insured it with an insurance company, which I'm not going to say, and after we have this issue, we go to them and we expect that at least we are going to be compensated. And then f now it has become one of our jobs. Every day we are in meetings, meetings are not ending, and we don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. So when people are going for cheap things, at times they don't know the cost of a cheap thing. Maybe I should have gone to Prudential. Now I would be smiling with my business running as normal as it should have been. So it's important that you educate the client. We are going to take the role of teachers before people can buy our product. Then for Ngabirano, this was not a question, but I think it's a good thing when you say that we need to educate the youth. When it comes to educating the youth, my own experience, because I work at the grassroots, I noticed that there are so many opportunities for information for the youth that are within the urban. People at times are even having an info gloat. You have too much information, you don't even know where to put it. But the issue is, there are youth out there that we are leaving out, and they are yearning for this information to put it to use. I want to give you some good news that we have digitized 500 parishes, rural parishes. They can be accessed any day, and they can get information any day. So people like you, who have experience in your area, come and join us give them information, educate them, even connect them to your own value chains. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And finally, Maxima, you had the first word, you have the last word. That's such an honor. Um, my take, I'd like to supplement on what Dr. Grigler said. You have, as a business owner, in order for me to hire a consultant, which I now do, I need to see the value proposition Many times service providers come and say, I'm going to do, say, financial books for you or ABCD without necessarily pointing out the exact value that they're adding. For example, I have people who have approached me to redesign a website, but they're not t telling me the story behind the theory that they want to implement. So for me, website design is basic, but the thing that will set you apart from the other person is to say, okay, I'm going to make your website look like a pitch deck. These are the items that I want to do, A, B, C, D. So when you give a customer exact value proposition without putting everything in the document, they will then have their eyes opened and they will take on your business. Lastly, most of the times we do not get to know about solutions simply because we do not take the time to read and get knowledgeable about things. Um, Honorable Chuanka was mentioning about the different financial institutions out there, but I'd like to bring to your notice institutions like the Microfinance Support Center, which gives out loans from as low as 7% to as high as 12% for investment. This is information I came to learn about from interacting with elders in the field and also from just looking. Like instead of wasting time laughing at TikTok videos, I actually look for, this is my problem, I need money, where am I going to get it from? Who are the cheapest money lenders or who are the cheapest financial institution out there? So we have to really invest in reading, getting more knowledgeable about things, that way we provide better value propositions for the customers and ourselves as well. Without that, there is nowhere we are going. Um, thank you. A round of applause for our panelists.
Panelists, you are free to go back and sit. And as they go, we will invite the CEO, Prudential. Thank no, you, Prudential, for having us and for you know facilitating us to be here. Mm. Please keep this up. We like talking to the youth, and we shall come back. Thank you. All right, thank you, ladies. Oh, okay. Let me hand over to the, uh, my colleague, the MC, to handle the pr uh, proceeding part. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, before we, we've come to the tail end of, uh, of, of this, but before we close, I would like to invite uh, the CEO. He has a, uh, a brief announcement to make. And thereafter, uh, we will have, as we call him back at Prudential, we'll have Uncle Zef, uh, Mr. Zefania Dube, um, who will give the closing remarks. He's our Chief Operations Officer. So, and then after that, I'll, re I'll request our panelists, uh, our keynote uh, speaker, to just come back for a, a group photo, and we'll call it a day. So, over to you, uh, Mr. Tete. Thank you, Peter. Um, Penina, can you just give us an idea what you do? I think you support um, people with disabilities. Can you give me a microphone, please? The makers of, the makers of homemade liquid detergent. I'm a social worker by profession. Uh, COVID did not spare me, but it taught me something. Working for an organization as a social worker and earning, <laughs> earning 350 with COVID, I managed to get an increase of 600, but still I could not maneuver. Being a parent, Taking care of children, I calculated it. I was working for food and sleep, and my worry was on my future. But being in an organization where I was taught how to make detergent, when COVID came in, I started making liquid soap, and I made sales in the first COVID. Calculating in a day where I could get my salary in one day like this, without even spending and doing it there. I applied for the government grant of the Youth Life Food Program as a group. And six of us in the group had disabilities. Then four of us didn't have disability. We managed to get money of 7 million and 90,000 Ugandan shillings. We just clapped our hands as the young people and said we are rich. Moving over the road, who started 11 of us, we are four of us with disability. Others ran out with money, others could not work, all that. And we are supposed to pay back this money to the government. We are supposed to pay the tax. And moving to that, we didn't know how it was gone. I had to register my business. And I was like, this will be a shame at the end of it all. So having moved through that, and all my friends, my clients, who have supported us in buying this detergent, moving, then how could we move? Hitting markets where I reached at Rupareria Foundation, took the samples, and I got a dealer like, you will supply to us very excited. And now going to Rupareria Foundation, having took all the requirements, and I was, it was my shock. Do you have UNBS satisfaction of the Q mark? I said, my goodness. When you get it, that's when you come and supply to us. I was confident. I told him, I'm in the process. I started moving up and down inquiring about UNBS registration. 
I applied online. I met the requirement, and it went through. At the end of it all, it was a bill for us to pay. And the bill was a total of two million per product, hand wash alone, two M. Satisfaction fee, laboratory test. I was like, what? So calculating all that, I'm like, eh, where will I get all this? I had to breathe and kept quiet. I think That's how I approached you, Thea, and it became to that. Currently, I haven't got the Q mark, struggling with the business of the detergent, and that is the way we are moving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penina. Thank you for that elaborate story. I think the biggest thing we can do for you is to expose you on this platform for as many people as possible to support your business. Now, first and foremost, we put a million shillings in there now, rising up to five billion shillings. And it's not just the money. Tony is seated right beside me. He has the support. The aim is to help you through this process, particularly because you work with people with disability. We commit to supporting you publicly on this platform, and I will make sure I drag Tony into this and all the others to support you to get your business on. Thank you very much. As your story was going on, Uncle Zef just nudged me and said, Titi, what can we do about this? And um, my team is around here. Thanks to the beauty of communication, um, we've discussed it and agreed. So I'm not making a hollow promise. They are all here. They can all be held accountable. And Penny and I will do this. Thank you all very much for your audience. Thank you. Can we welcome Uncle Zef on stage to give us his closing remarks? Then we can close this event. Let's put our hands together for him. Right. Where do I start? <laughs> First of all, I think I personally, personally, I have no words. I tell you, this panel, our keynote speaker, eh, one of the things that I've uh, kind of, uh, I've, I'm Zimbabwean, by the way, the names are Zephania Dube. You might think that uh, uncle is my first name and Zef is my surname. I'm called Zephania Dube, and I'm popularly known as Uncle Zef because I'm an uncle in Uganda. Okay. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm Zimbabwe, and I come from Zimbabwe. At least I'm, I'm better than uh, Tete because uh, when I came to Uganda the first time, I remember my ticket said uh, in Tebe, and all I knew was I was going to Kampala. So the ticket said in Tebe, I said, no, 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 no. You have made a mistake. I'm not going to in Tebe. I'm going to Kampala. <laughs> Little did I know, because in my mind, I never thought you could have a capital city without an airport. <laughs> OK. So that's a message for the government, OK? I think in a, in a few years' time, we'll get an airport, OK, here in Kampala. Right, so my, my mission is very short. Okay, it's a thank you one. First and foremost, I want to thank our guest keynote speaker. I tell you, to me, this is an honor. I've known her, by the way, uh, honorable, I've known you, or I know you, you didn't know Uncle Zef, you, you knowing him for the first time. I've known you because I've been here for 10 years. Okay. So we want to thank you for honoring this particular. It is not the first one. It's not the last one. We we'll have a lot of these. And the second thing, I want to thank our panelists. Let's give them a very big round of applause. It, it's a pity that time is not on our side, because we would have asked all of them to be here for the whole day. You, you, you know some of the things that came out, the takeaways for us as Prudential, one of the things that we're going to do, we're going to have sessions, we're going to have working committees. We want now to start designing products together. We want the SMEs, we want the banks, we want the lending institutions, and we want, I'm not going to say the insurance industry, I'm going to say Prudential. 
then you are going to have a working committee. Let's have products that address the needs. One of the things that we are at Prudential, one of the things that we brag about is we can design products in record time. Okay? So, John, I'm looking at you. You're going to be, you're going to drive this. You're going to lead on this. Me and you, John. John, you'll also be called an uncle from today, okay? You're going to be an uncle. So, I want to say on that, I think uh, on behalf of uh, the, sorry, the last thank you, my team from Prudential. I'm proud of you guys. Just look at what they've put together. This is one of the sessions that, you know, when you come and make a thank you in such a session with all the teams, I would like to say Prudential team, please rise up. Let people see who is from Prudential. <laughs> the Prudential team. Can you see how colorful they are? How smartly dressed they are? And even their insurance products are like that. <laughs> okay. So on that, I would like to, okay, normally people give me speeches to read. I'm like Mugabe, I don't read speeches. I just put them away and then talk from my head. I prefer, I enjoy it that way. Okay, so, but I will read this short, it's just for a minute. Right. On behalf of Prudential team, I'd like to thank you all for honoring this invitation. The Prudential Knowledge Series is part of our promise to walk the life journey with you. Just as our tagline says, let's face life together to lean our way. This is what we're going to do, and we're going to walk this journey. Our purpose is to help people make the most out of life. And in so doing, in so doing, we want to involve, okay, uh, we, we, we do not just do products, we also do this. Okay? We want people to know. We want people to be, we, we just want to share. We want to share knowledge. We want to share experiences. And most importantly, we want to work this together and design products together. From now on, we are going to involve all of you in the designing of products. So I want to thank you for listening to me. And okay, unlike Tete uh, Me, I know Mwevali Nyo, 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 Nyo. Okay, thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of the day. Uncle can talk until tomorrow, so I'll stop here. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much, Uncle Zef. So we've come to the end of this uh, edition of the Prudential Knowledge Series. We hope to see you at the next Knowledge Series. I would like to invite our panelists and, uh, and, and uh, our keynote speaker and our CEO. But before they do come, Titi, Please come forward, and uh, panelists can prepare themselves to come forth, um, and we may get this done. So the good news is I have from our panelists, Penina, another million shillings for you, from Dr. Basaza to support you. So the support has started coming through, and we will make this happen. Tony, you can run away. <laughs> can the panelists kindly join us on stage as we do this? All right, thank you, everyone. All right, so we'll have the picture with our, we'll have the picture with the keynote speaker.
Yes. Where is where is our moderator? What happened to your moderator? All right. So thank you very much. Uh, go forth and may your businesses thrive. <laughs> We'll do whatever it takes to touch the sky And we'll help each other reach our aspirations We know that we can do it if we strive We are prudential Our values mean a lot We are the people Who give it all we've got With a sunny disposition We can overcome the odds Yes, we have a valid reason to believe We are number one ah, We are number one ah, We are number one Number one Number one Number one Number one Number one my name is Edwin Kseka, a farmer and a businessman. Jonathan was my young brother. We had visions, plans and dreams, but unfortunately Jonathan left me. Jonathan left behind a two-year-old son. A few days after Jonathan's burial, I received a call from Prudential informing me that Jonathan had an education policy with them for his son Elvis, that Prudential would pay for Elvis's school fees up to university. That meant that Elvis would get the best education possible. With over 24 million satisfied customers worldwide, and 170 years of existence. Don't worry about your child's future education. Be happy with True EduSave, and let's face life together. Tudinawi.